Hello there, taxidermists and gentle peeps. This is Neil Woman coming to you again with Digital Taxidermy. Um, and I've got a video for you this time about chamfers, fillets, bevels, and uh, how to corner better with your FDM optimized prints. So this is going to be a fairly in-depth little chat about um, the merits of uh, handling corners when you're trying to make a model for FDM printing. Obviously the same principles don't apply for resin printing because it's done via projection. But if you're making prints that are optimized for FDM, uh, which is something I try to do all the time because uh, FDM prints printers are some of the most common on the market. Um, what we try to do is to make the machine replicate the shape in as easy and practical way as possible. So um, when you are setting up your FDM printer, obviously uh, in order to get a good replication, the first thing you'll do is E-steps, flow, uh, belt tensions, uh, and all those sorts of things to try and ensure that you replicate the shape that is on um, the digital file as best as possible. Now, it doesn't just stop there with the end user. Uh, some of the ability to replicate the file is in the hands of the designer themselves. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see this interesting little shape that I've uh, created here. Uh, and it's just a little thing to display uh, different bevels. So depending on uh, your background and modeling software, um, they may be called different things. So in Blender, for example, they're just called bevels. Um, traditionally, um, these bits here um, would be a round over or a fillet. Um, so that gives you a, a radius corner. Um, and then this bit here uh, is a chamfer. So a chamfer is basically taking a plane cut across the corner. Um, it, usually they're at 45 degrees. Uh, however, you can also specify varying degrees depending again on your modeling software. So that's uh, a basic term for them. So bevels, fillets, chamfers. Um, <clears throat> why do we use them? Well, this goes down to the way machines operate. Uh, an FDM printer is a CNC um, a fusion deposition melting machine. So it's effectively a CNC hot melt glue gun. Okay, so the, the head is moved along planes using Cartesian coordinates. Um, and the two axes operate separately. So you've got the X axes and the Y axes. And uh, they will all um, accelerate and stop at various uh, times and speeds to replicate a shape. So you to perform this, you'll come down this side and then the Y axis will stop and then the X axis will pick up and then the X axis stops, the Y picks up and that keeps going. Now, when you get to uh, a bevel like this, uh, a fillet, the um, one axis slows down at the same time as the next one picks up. Um, and so, and then the other one slows down and the next one picks up. And why that's important is if your print head comes to a stop in both axes at the same time, the extruder doesn't always come to a stop as well. Now, um, it, it may stop extruding, but built up pressure and heat will cause um, a little bit more material to be pushed out. Uh, if you've ever used a silicon gun, 
um, or a cake icing uh, thing, you'll know that once you've squeezed it, there's some built-up pressure that still has to be released. Toothpaste, same thing. So um, if your print head comes to a stop, a dead stop in both axes for a very short period of time, you will find that it will extrude more than the machine is expecting. And what this can do is cause artifacts in your corner, both on the internal and external. Uh, I've got a couple of pictures I'll be able to show you. So this is on an external corner. You can see, so this in the model is a square corner. Uh, no fillets or chamfers on this. So uh, one axis comes along, comes to a dead stop, um, and then it holds there before the next axis picks up. And you get this little loop, um, and that loop carries all the way up the seam of the print and gives this kind of exaggerated feel. Now, some people may try and tune that out of their printer. Uh, however, you know, you could be fighting that for a very, very long time. Um, and really, it's something that can be handled in the actual model itself very simply. Uh, the same thing is true with the internal corners. So uh, you can see here um, where this kind of bowls outwards uh, from the corner. It doesn't just come in go straight back out um, you can see here the lines become much thicker all the way through and then when you get to the outside there's no room for expansion and so it forms this this curve and so there's ways that we can get around that you can see it here as well um, and it just sort of where it throws out that extra filament and it just gets in the way causes a lot of problems so there's ways that we can get rid of those and that's using fillets and chamfers <clears throat> so firstly fillets um, if you it depends on what exactly you are des designing for so as a designer you have the luxury of potentially being able to uh, tell the uh, printer or if you're doing the printing, you can design specifically. So uh, if you are doing a large model, maybe you'll be designing for a 0.8 millimeter nozzle or a 0.6. Um, but predominantly in the home printing market, you'll be designing for a 0 0.4 nozzle. So um, when we design for FDM, uh, we will design um, in our minds for a 0.4 millimeter nozzle to be printed at 0 0.2 millimeter layer height. Um, so you can get a, a finer reproduction by printing at 0.1. Um, people can choose other layer heights, but we try to make our detail replicable at 0.2 millimeter layer height. Uh, this is mainly because we do uh, larger bits of terrain in vehicles. Um, uh, and this is what we calibrate to because it's faster for people to print uh, and if your detail is designed to be printed um, at that scale uh, then there'll be no problems using that layer height setting. So <clears throat> what does that mean for these fillets? So you want to avoid square corners if you are using a 0.4 millimeter nozzle then the minimum radius that you can put on is 0.4 millimeters um, so this means that both axes will have a chance to slow down and pick up causing the head to remain in motion at all times um, this solves uh, a lot of the blobbing that you get on the corner because you don't have any built up pressure squeezing out excess the extruder has time to react and all of the axes are in motion continually uh, one of the other interesting things that uh, happens of course when you uh, hit a square corner um, is that that sudden stop 
in one or both directions will cause additional vibration um, which can cause things like ghosting um, and it can also uh, start to cause additional wear and tear on the machine. I mean that's very minor however uh, it also depends on how you've got your speed and jerk settings set up. So um, by doing um, fillets specifically uh, you could actually speed up your prints and retain the same print quality. Um, a larger fillet, so uh, say this is 0.4 millimeters, it will have a certain amount of time to slow down and pick up on the next axes. The larger the fillet, um, the more slow down and pick up time there will be. Now chamfers still have a corner. Um, and these corners um, will still cause the axes to come to a stop. Um, however, because they have split it from 90 degrees, um, the time of that stop is a lot less. So now it begs the question of where would you use fillets or chamfers? Um, Specifically, fillets work best in the XY plane. Okay, so um, X and Y working together um, flat on the surface. Uh, that's where your fillets will work best. Chamfers are best for the Z plane. So uh, any vertical feature would be better um, with a chamfer. Um, this doesn't mean that you have to use them like that exclusively, um, but they are better suited for those uh, operations. So I've prepared a few sketches that we can look at to go through some of these. Um, so let me just have a little look here. Um, <clears throat> So we can go into this sketch and have a little look at, at what we've got here. So this is gives you an idea of what a chamfer looks like. So here is um, a slice through um, of your print. Okay, so at a 0.2 layer height with a 0.4 millimeter line width um, you will get something that looks kind of like this you may find that it's more like that uh, rather than exactly this nodule shape but <clears throat> for the most part you get a slightly rounded edge to each line extrusion so when you have a chamfer that is 45 degrees in the um, in the Z along the Z axis you will find that each of your layers will stack up like this and you have some overlap um, if you if you run a line directly down here you'll see that basically half of the previous line is being laid down on top of the uh, one below it. Um, <clears throat> this gives you plenty enough support um, and your overhang is just fine. Uh, so you can use them um, to be able to uh, allow you to extrude things from a surface without using supports. You won't need supports for any of this. Your machine is perfectly capable of handling this. And so that allows you to make extruded detail further out than you otherwise would. Um, and if you're placing them underneath things like window sills or whatever, they can be hidden and you'll barely ever, no one will ever see them because it's not the angle at which these are ever viewed. Here we can see that if you change the angle, so this is uh, 60 degrees off the horizontal, um, you have an even better coverage from one line to the next. 
Uh, and what that means is you'll get a stronger bond in your external wall, bearing in mind that there is still, say, another two of these lines behind here, um, because there'll be, say, three perimeters uh, in your print. But your ex exterior wall will have a much higher fidelity than uh, with 45 degrees. However, this is very useful um, to use. So there you go, much tighter, tighter packed. Um, that's just fine. Now here, we see if you go 30 degrees off the horizontal, um, that what you've got is barely any of it is um, being laid down on top of the previous layer. And uh, what this means is that you will end up having a lot of your, um, a lot of these lines will start to droop down. So they will, they will start to droop, uh, droop down. Um, you'll get a lot of feathering, you'll get a lot of um, like loose layers. Uh, it won't be too pretty. So um, when you start to get to these sorts of angles and overhangs, that's where you're going to need supports. So uh, that gives you an idea of a chamfer along the Z plane uh, and what sort of effect that gives you, okay? So on to the next one. Um, <clears throat> here, again, this is in the Z plane. Uh, we're sliced through uh, so that we can see it again. There's a lot of numbers, um, but we'll go through what this all means. So um, here you can see uh, a fillet with a radius of 0 0.4 millimeters. And you can see here that um, if your slicer was to replicate this, you may find that um, your you may find that your initial layer, um, depending on how your slicer operates, uh, you may find that your initial layer um, starts a little bit further over. Um, but you can see here how effectively it misses that whole corner um, and it just jumps from uh, this point to this point. So um, you get you don't get a great replication of that curve, so it's almost pointless in putting it in. Um, but it's perfectly replicable. Um, you know, it just doesn't doesn't really make any any difference at all. Here we can see a curve at um, 0 0.8 mil uh, radius and what we've got is a similar thing going to the 30 degree chamfer is we've got quite a large overhang here. Um, I mean these these will come out because uh, as you can see there's about a third of the, the next layer is being laid down on top of it. You'll just about get this to come out. You might find that this layer starts to droop just a little bit, um, but ultimately it should be okay. Uh, but again, the key point here is in fact, you'll just get a step. So you completely lose the fidelity of the radius of that curve. So it's kind of, again, it's kind of pointless when you, you've got an external curve in the Z plane. And that's where we get all this stepping. Um, this could be improved by uh, changing your layer height. So um, if I change that down uh, and I change that down, you know, um, <clears throat> we can start to see that you will get a better replication of the curve. Uh, however, you will still find you will still find that that first step is a doozy. <laughs> um, so you you will lose this bit of the curve, but the rest of the layers will then make that up. 
Okay, uh, so let me just put that back to 0.2. Um, if we come across to this one, again, just to sort of show you the effects that this can have on the thing, this is a 1.2 millimeter diameter. And again, that first layer is just a complete step. For this one, um, you'll f you'll have a lot of trouble for that to uh, come out particularly well. Now, bearing in mind this is 0.2 millimeters, so if this was on your base layer, for example, um, if you were printing with a brim, this will probably end up on the brim, or it will um, extrude almost to the base. So. Um, this this area is totally unpredictable as to what's going to happen um, we can see if we draw this line um, there's not very much being covered there's not going to be a lot of squish on this and it could go anywhere the layers above it however uh, again start to follow that curve quite nicely um, and then we get to the big one which is a 2.4 um, millimeter radius um, and you will see here this this completely misses the layer below it so uh, you want to try and avoid external curves on the underside of what you're printing okay uh, it's not going to do you any favors um, it's going to make that first layer a bit of a problem um, and yeah it's it's just something to avoid okay so <clears throat> on to the next example here is a concave fillet okay so we can use these again for <clears throat> um in the same way as the chamfer um, to sort of add support to uh, so say this is a windowsill okay and this is where a wall is so we're going to use the fillet to fill in this gap okay um, so the fillet itself um, you get a kind of nice step thing there but then when you get to this point in the curve you see uh, how far it travels in uh, one one plane uh, to a point where this is what about a quarter it's only printing with about a quarter coverage on the um, on the layer previous so at that point again this is where you get this edge would start to droop down you'd experience feathering and it wouldn't be that tight um, you may even find that this layer becomes quite loose as well so uh, you have to watch whenever you have a concave um, radius uh, on the underside of things that is going to generate an overhang um, we can move on to the next one here uh, this is a radius of 0 0.8 and again we see this good fidelity on the curve uh, and then we get to the top of the curve and this one is completely missing that entirely completely so that would again um, <clears throat> what would probably happen is say earlier on in the line you've stepped out and you're going across uh, so this would be held up and it would just uh, fall down and wave in thin air uh, and then that will probably mean that this one as well would be a very loose layer uh, may start picking up again by the time you get to the third layer above it but it won't be pretty uh, and the same again when we get to like a radius of 1.2 uh, only this time um, you're even further out so your inner line here is going to have trouble laying down all in all that becomes a bit of a problem um, however we can put this right uh, so you don't have to avoid these entirely um, let's just fix that okay so 
with that fixed so we kind of want that to be about there and we want that to be about there so how are we going to do that um, so the best way for us to try and achieve that is to uh, get the fillet tool and we will um, put another fillet in there so this one is we're going to try a radius of 0 0.4 and see what that gives us so if we just make that tangential to there like that so that doesn't quite cut it um, but what we can do is just increase that so say 0.6 and we start to get back on top of it again um, 0.8 we can pull it right in there so you can use combinations of fillets um, to enable you to support um, things that are further out and again this will probably be below something you won't be able to see it from the underside um, so uh, there's lots there's lots of ways that you can hide these and use various things to um, to save you uh, from some of these troubles. The other option that you have is to uh, chamfer. So let's just see if we put a chamfer in there and we do a 0.4. I love it when these things play ball. Well, we can do it manually. So we can put a chamfer in. At 45 degrees to the vertical. Um, and then we can actually use this to try and find where would be a good position. Make that tangential to there. And then so we can use this to sort of slide it extend it to there and we can get a measurement to just sort of see what that comes out at so that's a 0 0.55 so anywhere between a 0 0.5 and a 0 0.6 millimeter chamfer off of the concave radius will allow you to pick up those lines again um, again just hiding some of the the lower layers and allowing you to push a piece of detail out much further than you otherwise would do okay so that's covered um, things on the uh, along the z-axis so your vertical details how layer height <coughs> affects your use of fillets and chamfers so we can see from that why using a chamfer on the Z axis is your best bet. Yeah. And if you must use a fillet, then um, a concave fillet, uh, and depending on how far you're going, um, just taking that corner off again to slide slide the layers above back a little bit just so it's nice and supported um, these can be useful but again your lower your lower layers are going to have issues unless they have some other supports in there as well um, so we can go from there and I have another little example here so <clears throat> this is along the X and Y plane. So, firstly, we can start off here. Um, there we go. Um, so, this is an example of... Okay, let's look at this. We have a square corner. Okay. Your print head at 0.4 millimeter diameters is coming along imagine it hitting a wall it just hits that wall and then goes off at the other at the other uh, angle at 90 degrees to it so 
comes along, your um, acceleration settings and jerk settings kick in, poof, everything comes to a stop, and then you get an oozing happening here, which is then why this happens. Um, and then off it goes. So um, if we get rid of that, that is the equivalent of putting in a 0.2 millimeter um, a 0.2 millimeter radius fillet okay so if you've put a 0.2 millimeter radius that is the same as your 0.4 millimeter nozzle which means it comes along and it treats it pretty much exactly as a square corner I would be very surprised if your slicer makes any additional uh, acceleration or deceleration calculations uh, based on the fact that that has a radius um, than if it was a square corner so ultimately it's no different and still um, your print head would cover that area and you would have thought you would lose that bit of corner but in fact what you get is a blob coming out here like uh, like that okay so that's that's what causes that um, this next one is the radius of 0 0.4 millimeters so it's a radius of 0 0.4 and you've got a nozzle with a diameter of 0 0.4 so uh, your oops, it's going everywhere um, so your nozzle travels along here, travels along, and then it starts to hit this line. Yeah. So at the point this uh, this fillet becomes tangent to the plane of travel, um, it starts to kick up. The this axis is slowing down, this axis is speeding up, and you have a smooth transfer all the way through. Uh, and this means that nothing has to stop all at once you know nothing is coming to a dead stop at this point here um, this axis has come has stopped but the head is being dragged off in the other direction so you don't get any excess oozing any build up any issues there so then we have the next one uh, and this is a radius of 0 0.8 so double again and we can really see it here is there's plenty of time for this axis to slow down and the next axis to pick up the travel uh, and you'll get a really nice smooth curve so you can see from these that you don't need a massive radius on all the edges um, and it's deceptive like you you will barely notice on a lot of them um, that these radii are there um, but it will make a, a massive difference like for example this all you'll do is smooth off the corner and you might think that oh hang on that doesn't make it quite so sharp well remember if you've got a sharp corner it does this okay and that's that's not so sharp either so um, you're making a compromise to get potentially better fidelity in the model um, and again it's a smoother print um, your your printer isn't jerking about quite so much um, and it, it sounds better and you'll get less chance of ghosting um, all in all it's much better for your final model now here I've got an example of a chamfer on the uh, XY plane. So uh, still you will have a point where uh, one axis comes to a stop and the other picks up. But in actual fact you'll find that because it's not so sudden, because effectively it's been the, the 90 degree turn has been split into two. Um, if you do that you also um, split the deceleration steps into two as well so um, while you are cutting the corner out um, and putting this edge on it um, 
it's not quite as effective as a fillet in keeping everything moving. Um, but it certainly does help rather than just have that jarring blow of this hitting a wall. Um, so you can imagine it as this ball being kicked against the wall, or in this case, it's being pushed up a ramp. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you can, you can do that experiment yourself, you know, make a ramp, throw a ball at it, throw the ball at the wall, see which one has a harder time changing direction. <laughs> um, and that's the effect that you're, you're giving your printer. Um, or whoever's printer every time it hits a corner on your model. Now, sometimes you might like to make aesthetic choices to have those square corners and stuff. Uh, perhaps you don't want to uh, start cutting them off. And that's fine. Uh, you know, we all have these choices to make. Uh, all I would say is that where possible, consider using fillets on the XY plane and then use um, chamfers on the uh, in the Z plane to be able to uh, help cope with overhangs and deal with various other things. Um, also, you'll notice, interestingly, this little hole that I have here. Um, so I did this to demonstrate a little point as well, because <clears throat> you might think, okay. I want to do a cutout in the middle of a thing. Say I've got a peg that needs to go into a socket or I've got a, uh, a trap door I want to put into a floor. So how do you make a square cutout? Because what we know is that when you go on an internal corner, you're going to get blobbing, which is going to curve it around uh, just like this. So you have this, this curve. So then your peg isn't going to fit in the hole because your tolerances will be off because it's getting squished because of this jerky motion that's going on. Um, you can see it in these holes here. Um, these, these holes haven't been filleted. Um, and so you've got this rounding off of the internal corners. So you have a few options. Either you can design in some fillets and then also do that on your pegs as well so it replicates it. Um, but the better option um, is to... Uh, let me just bring the sketch up. Your better option is to try this. <clears throat> So this is what we call a dog bone. Um, and what I've done here is very simply, I put a radius of 0 0.2 millimeters circle on the, uh, in line with uh, the direction of travel uh, and tangential to the direction that it will be going. Um, <clears throat> So we do that, we cut it out, uh, and it's called a dog bone uh, because if we do the same to over here, that's a radius of 0.2, which makes it 0.4 millimeters in total. Uh, if we do the same over here, you see it looks like a bone. Hurrah! Um, so we do that. And then we can cut out the hole. And what you have is this. And there's still this corner here. So what we're going to do with that corner is to get our fillet tool. And we're going to put a fillet on there. Um, so you can do it several ways. I mean, we've already looked at uh, the angles for fillets. So... This is a nice, nice big circle that it's going to do um, around there. You can either do it at a 0.4, which we saw give it a good flow, 
Um, what I tend to do though for these particular ones is do a two millimetre uh, fillet uh, and that actually that cuts it off down uh, almost to the apex of that turn so it, it's now making about a hundred and twenty degree arc and then it starts coming back on itself and this this creates a nice smooth motion for the print head um, and you look at that and you think cool oh, that's that's really made a mess of that slot you know like that's that's not going to come out particularly well at all now remember you've got to deal with a certain amount of expansion um, but what we have got rid of is this big old blobbing in the corner so where we've taken it from uh, taken all of that we've also stopped it doing that which is which is great um, now just to give you an example of how small this piece actually is uh, and why this is quite insubstantial um, I'll just take you into Cura um, and you know if you're as you're familiar with how big the bed of the ender is this is absolutely tiny but it just gives you a good example here of what what this dog boning actually means in the grand terms um, you see it doesn't actually make a great deal of difference this this minor deviation from the path is just enough to make sure that this remains a square corner and doesn't interfere with any of your fit or tolerance um, for if you're trying to put a peg in there um, now again this is this is just so we can have a little look for our own our own benefit but we can see here the pathing um, as it goes through the layers so you've got a very small curve there and we've got a very large curve there and you can see here where it makes that crease here this is this is where you'll get that blobbing occur okay so um, and the same here is where it makes this crease the blobbing will happen here effectively you're going to get a, a big cir circle of excess turn up here and here as well you where you do the chamfers you will get a small amount of blobbing but it won't be as big as um, as where these 90 degree ones are okay so you can sort of see how how that affects uh, the point of travel uh, and then just round on this other side if we can do that without it going crazy uh, again we can see here where you've got the larger fillet and the layer lines they practically miss each other so you can imagine if that was the other way up uh, this would get laid down and then this would be drooping over the over the top so I mean we can demonstrate that right now so just flip that over slice that try and bring it back into place where we can see it And there you go you can see the same as on the little diagram that I did this layer is practically being laid down in thin air and that again is uh, that's a that's a 0 0.8 millimeter radius that's on there so hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight into how to turn a corner when you're optimizing your um, your models for FDM printing um, it's not particularly difficult to get the hang of as I say you want um, fillets in the XY plane and you want chamfers in the Z plane um, and using combinations of those uh, you can then get some really quite good effects uh, and you can get a much stable much stabler more repeatable detail um, 
with very little effort. So that's something that's worth practicing on. Um, try it out on some models that you're making if you're having problems with uh, repeating certain models or tolerances and fits maybe you need to just put a little chamfer on there or a little fillet um, or change the orientation in which it's being printed uh, that that might help as well uh, so anyway i hope that's helped um, it's something that i've been using extensively uh, and i look for a lot whenever i'm finishing off a model um, if you've got any further questions uh, if there's anything that you think i haven't covered um, or if you think that you, you there's something that i i need to know about this that would, that would be really helpful as well um, if there's any other videos that you'd like me to make or topics that you'd like me to cover uh, then just let me know in the comments below uh, I'd really like to hear what you think about this series, if it's any use to you, if it's not. Um, please let your friends know. Uh, this is all useful stuff. I hope that I'm uh, doing well in passing on my knowledge. Um, and that's about it for now. Um, take a look at our Troll Common playset. Uh, the Kickstarter is still running. It's doing quite well. Um, our Patreon Buyers Club is uh open for more members uh get yourself some deals in there uh we've got some new models going in next month and this month has got a whole bundle plus welcome packs uh for you to pick up uh and we'll be about on the discord server that that gives us gives you access to if you want to discuss anything in more detail that we've covered in any of these videos um also, if you've got any models that you are having issues with that you might want me to check out, um, feel free to get in touch and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so that's all for now, peeps. Hope that helps. Have fun turning a corner with your modeling skills. See you later. Bye bye now. Like the video, follow me around. Press the bell, it makes no sound. Like the video, press subscribe. I don't know why I am alive.